Can I just confirm that my uh, slides are visible? Yes, I yeah. see them. Because awesome. I'm trying a new setup. Um, yeah, so my name is Sally Hoogboom. I'm currently at the University of Amsterdam uh, as a PhD student for just one more month because I decided to quit. Um, but the research I'm presenting now is part of my uh, master thesis. Um, so I'm quite passionate about it still. Um, to those who of you who are familiar with this image, I would say thank you for reading the paper um, because it's directly from the paper. Uh, let me quickly see. I just quickly want to point out that this work was obviously supervised. Uh, so it was supervised by Ferlina Hermans, who is in Leiden at the moment, uh, also in the Netherlands. Uh, she was uh, mainly in charge of making sure that the content's okay. Uh, and then I was also supervised by Han van der Maas, who, who was in charge of the daily supervision and then also more of the psychometric parts and how to validate like a new assessment. Um, and then finally, this work would not be possible without actually collaborating with the company that we used to collect the data. Uh, so it's now called ProWise Learn before it was called OofenWeb. And we'll get a little bit more into that later. Um, so really what I want to talk about about is the, the assessment that we developed. And it's also kind of like a sales pitch uh, for you researchers basically, because I do think that we created something very useful that could, for example, be used uh, as a pre and post test uh, type of thing, or could also help teachers to kind of get what they should be teaching their uh, students in which order. Then again, it's the first study on this, so nothing's uh, definite yet, as you can imagine. Uh, yeah. So uh, the content of the talk, first I'll, I'll quickly talk about what we actually want to ach uh, achieve with this uh, assessment, uh, then what's actually included in it, uh, then why we used adaptive measurements uh, and what the benefits are also for the, the implications that we can have. Uh, so the practical implications of the research that we did. Uh, and then looking to the future, obviously there's still quite a bit uh, left to do. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about two points because, you know, presentation time is limited. Um, so I was very glad that in every of the talks, we already basically learned that the definition of comput computational thinking is quite a struggle. And I thought maybe it was just me, but I'm glad to see that everyone's struggling. Um, and then if you talk about computer science, there's more to it than just algorith algorithms or algorithmic th thinking. So that's why we talk, uh, chose programming concepts, just to make sure that it's not, it doesn't cover everything uh, computational thinking wise or compu uh, computer science wise, uh, but still it covers the, uh, the important algorithmic concepts, I think. Uh, so that's just a quick clarification. Um, so looking at the literature, we've had quite a lot of uh, overviews already, and they were very useful. So thankfully, that ties into my very um, brief overview. Basically, if we look at what's available now, they, uh, the assessments are, in my opinion, uh, quite resource intensive, right? So if you think about interviews, if you have to do that as a re uh, researcher, researcher, uh, that, that will take quite a lot of time, resources, both in uh, time and money. Um, then some of those uh, studies actually lack validation criteria. So we've everyone's talked about the computational thinking test. That's an exception. Uh, but in the overview of uh, Tang et al., so 20, uh, 2020, they do find that actually only 18% of the studies that they, or the assessments that they looked at, had some sort of validation criteria, or actually like specific criteria of what they're aiming to measure. So that's quite low, we can say. Um, and then some of these measurements are very specific. So if you look at Dr. Scratch, that would only, that's like an uh, automated evaluation of Scratch programs. And so it only works if you then actually build uh, something in Scratch first. Um, so we're looking to kind of resolve that. Uh, then Obviously, some assessments are doing good things, so we want to point that out as well. So, for example, the computational thinking test, they use multiple choice items, and that makes it very easy to administer and code, so very low in resources. And we think that's important, especially in research. Um, well, we need validation, of course. So, again, the computational thinking test, and then the, they've recently made the beginner's computational thinking test, so that's for, like, uh, younger children even. 
Uh, and I think what's also important that they use like block or pseudo text base. So you don't actually have to be familiar with the, the entire syntax of a programming language, but you can still do the test and we can still kind of determine uh, your ability. Uh, so we wanted to take these things into our test as well, our assessments. And then what we're adding is we're going beyond what's been done. So we're, we've created over 4,000 items. I will say that conceptually, uh, they measure uh, some of the same concepts, but because we've scaled it up this much, we can you can actually create pre and post tests that have the same difficulty but are actually different questions. So you don't have the psychometric issues of, um, I've lost the word, uh, getting familiar with the test procedure basically, or with the items if you do, if you do the test twice. Um, we've added some different concepts. Um, and then also importantly, we collect norm data. So we've, we've collected data across the entire scale of Dutch primary school children. So that's from age four to 13. There's only three age four children. So we'll say age five through 13. Um, and that's very useful because then you can actually see, okay, where are my students or pupils or whoever you're measuring falling within the, the distribution. We'll look at that distribution later on as well. Um, so these are our goals basically with this assessment and why we created it and why we think it has value. Um, then obviously there are some design constraints. Okay, so we can't do everything in every assessment. Um, so the first thing that we want is to basically be, yeah, the decrease the reliability that we have on language. Um, so that is also suitable for younger children because we see that in these apps and games, children can already program even though they cannot yet read. Um, so the less languages included, the better it will be suited for those children. Um, consistent interface. So in pre-testing, we found that children sometimes struggled if they had to do different types of interfaces or different types of syntaxes all at once in one assessment. So we wanted to have the same thing. Um, and then we wanted the concepts to be suitable. So I'll get back to this, but basically we thought that some computer science concepts so, such as recursion, uh, where you kind of like loop back into itself uh, would not be suitable for this age range. So then again, uh, spoiler alert for the results, uh, the test was too simple. So maybe it could have been uh, useful for these children, uh, but we decided to stay basically on the safe side and have easy concepts. Uh, and then we wanted it to be multiple choice. That's also part of the, the system where we collected the data and it has to be multiple choice. There has to be one correct answer. Uh, right, so let's look at the content, what's actually included. So I wanted to show everything that's not possible, time constraints yet again. So these are the concepts that we've included. So there's loops, conditions. Uh, we added some concepts that are well-defined, yet the results show that they do not measure the concept that we intended to measure. So for example, if I talk about multiple agents, what we wanted to measure was that sometimes to uh, agents, in this case gnomes, they would have to work together, as it were, to end up at a mutual goal, which is one of the um, like more parallel programming type uh, concepts. But when we look at the data, this was not at all what we achieved. Um, so yeah, we can see that that's okay. Uh, so I, if you were to create a pre and post test, don't use this uh, concept, but the other ones I think are quite uh, good. And examples of all of the items are available at our uh, Open Science Framework page. And then also how they were created, what the intention was and everything. Yeah, so I just have the, the one to highlight a little bit what we did. So this is uh, to measure if conditions. And in this case, we call it if at unmet. So when, generally, when you have a conditional statement, the conditional statement can evaluate to true or false. And in this case, it evaluates to false. Um, so this is the easiest item in that uh, conceptual bubble, so to say. So basically it reads here, uh, the gnome goes down one, and then if the gnome is on the orange square, it goes right. And basically what the students would have to, um, to know is that if the gnome goes down, it's standing here at the star. And so the condition is not met and the, the algorithm is not executed. So the correct answer in this case is the star. But then of course we want to also know, okay, so what if 
these children don't understand this if condition and not everything that's visible is actually yes or no executed. So we have the misconception in there as well that everything is executed. And you see from these percentages of the responses that 55% uh, of the, the responses, you know, is the correct answer, but then the misconception also occurs quite uh, often. And this abundance of data could actually help us to identify, okay, where are children going wrong? Um, we haven't, it's not included in the paper, but the data is there and it would be very useful some, like if we looked at it at some point. Uh, this is the most difficult of this item. So then there's two uh, arrows executed. This is not executed. And this again is executed as it were, if you had like a longer stretch of code. Um, yeah, so I wanted to highlight here that we have multiple co concepts and we look at misconceptions if possible in the hopes that uh, ultimately it would help teachers with their teaching to know, okay, this child is doing this, these types of concepts consistently wrong, then it would uh, signal to them, okay, we need to maybe interfere and give some additional instructions. Um, so yeah, talking about adaptive measurements, let us first say what it is. So we use Math Garden. I don't, I don't expect anyone really to be uh, familiar with it, but it uh, was created by uh, Marta Stratemeyer as her PhD project, uh, also together with Han. So that's you know the tie-in. Um, and basically, the idea was uh, they wanted to track uh, development in mathematical abilities, and they basically said so. If we want to do that, we would have to administer tests regularly to children and that would be very annoying for both the children and the schools so that is unfeasible so basically what they did they made it a, a game type of interface so these are all the different types of mathematical games that are in there it looks fun the children have fun they were basically the better they get the more flowers they get uh, and so as children play we measure uh, and we collect uh, a lot of data and then for the teachers, it's also very useful because they track the progress over time. So for example, in this curve, and they can see how children are doing compared to their peers across the Netherlands, not just in their, their own classes. So that's very valuable to uh, teachers. Um, yeah, so this environment makes it very easy for us to collect a lot of data at once and very quickly. Um, but why do we use adaptive measurements? So this, they made this graph. Uh, it's published here in this paper. Um, basically, if you look at the ability of children, so for example, in grade two, so in Dutch system, that is, uh, you're about, no, that eight, I think. Uh, the, the entire distribution curve of their ability is super broad, right? So some children are, are just stuck at doing six times one, and then some uh, are already possible here to like do 20 times 64. And at the same time in grade five, so that's like three years up, there will be children that are worse than the children in uh, grade two. And so basically this system also allow, it adapts to the ability of the children. And so it allows us to collect this distribution curve, but also make sure that the children have fun at their own level of ability. Um, and we wanted to use the adaptive measurements so that we can actually estimate this curve and see where the different um, concepts fall. So how does it work? Basically, this little smiley represents uh, a player and they compete basically against the question. And this is similar to how the chess ratings are done. So like an ELO based rating system. And what happens uh, is when they answer correctly and very fast, uh, the player's ability uh, estimate will uh, increase and the item will decrease uh, simultaneously. And basically, this is a continuous loop. So every time a child answers a single item, it's updated, updated, updated. Uh, and this, this basically means that both the players kind of like move along and the items keep on moving. Uh, for the technical details, I refer you to this paper over here. Yeah, so it's just, um, it's all very uh, basic. But the benefits are as follows. So I don't expect this image to be legible, but I hope that this gray curve is actually visible to you guys. And then hopefully also sort of the scale down here. So basically this is the item difficulty scale and it ranges on the left from minus 11 
to plus 11. Uh, the actual skill itself is not uh, interesting. It's only interesting when you compare it with the uh, player ability. But basically all of these little dots are the items and you can see that, that we get an entire distribution of item difficulty. So we know for each item, whether it's maybe easy or harder or like which item is the most difficult. And then this is like clustered based on uh, how we, um, we cluster the concepts and the difficulty of the concepts. But that's not entirely what I want to speak about. Basically, at the same scale, even though it's now uh, at a different axis, the player axis is, uh, is on the same scale as the item difficulty. And again, we can kind of collect, no, not kind of, we collect the norm data for the, um, uh, the, the students, so for ages and gender. Um, and then if you compare it, basically this red line I've added, this is kind of where our assessment ends, right? So this is, there are some items left, but the bulk of the items is to the left. And that's like an uh, item difficulty of five. Um, but it, when you look at the player ability, quite a large set of players, it has an ability higher than the difficulty of five. So that's also why I already said that we think the assessment could be more difficult. Yeah. Uh, so the practical implications, Basically, we fitted some models to see whether we could predict the, the, the item difficulty, because uh, if you can predict the item difficulty based, based on the content that's in the items, that is a measure of internal val uh, validity. And so we found that the best predictor of item difficulty is the item type. So basically the, the cognitive concept included, the number of instructions. So it, does it have like two or uh, 12 arrows for you to process? and then the number of responses given by children. And then if you look at this uh, graph, so we have the adjusted R squared uh, on the Y axis, and this is uh, the trend over time. It's important that this line stabilizes so that these, these models stabilize, because basically what that means is that when we draw conclusions today, those would be the same as a week ago or may, uh, also the, the, the next week, because these items keep on moving. We want to we want to make sure that we can actually infer conclusions. And based on these analyses, we can actually do that. And so then we can actually look at this graph. Uh, so here we have the, the cognitive concepts again, or the programming concepts, how you want to call them, uh, as we define them. And here is the item difficulty scale again. And basically each of these dots is uh, an item, one question. Uh, please for now, ignore the orange ones because I talk about it in the paper, but I don't think it's relevant for now. Uh, and basically what you can now see is that, uh, for example, all of these ones here at the bottom have quite similar difficulty. And then for example, procedures, somewhat as expected is the most difficult concept for people to understand that basically a little bit of outside uh, algorithm gets put inside the, the current algorithm. Um, but this could perhaps help teachers to kind of understand, okay, I should start with the basic arrows and the, the basic sequences that make sense, but then also that loops are not as complicated. The basic, the very basic loops are not as complicated as we might think as adults. Uh, the children easily understand that they should do something three or four times and that's completely um, understandable for them. Uh, as I said about the multiple agents, because it's so easy, this led us to conclude, okay, it's not really different from basic sequences at all, uh, because it's just too agents doing a basic sequence and it, it's not really the intended concept that we wanted to achieve. Um, but for example, you also see here that an if add statement where the condition is met is obviously easier because you can just execute everything that's on the screen. It doesn't actually involve uh, require you to understand the conditional concept that sometimes the condition is not met. And that's why the if add unmet is so much more difficult. So I think that's uh, very interesting. Uh, and useful hopefully for teachers as well. So finally, in like two minutes, uh, perspectives for the, the future. So first of all, there uh, I, I copy pasted all of the papers. I think lots of them have been discussed already. Uh, we need to uh, check how this uh, assessment holds up next to other assessments that have already been validated. So for me personally, the starting point would be the computational thinking test, but there are other useful um, measurements out there as well. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to do it, please 
contact me. I would be up for a collaboration. I Because I'm quitting academia, I will not be working on it myself, but I do think I can still collaborate intellectually. Um, and then finally, we want we, it needs to be more difficult. And one of the easiest ways to achieve that is uh, to go from an, a multiple choice framework to an open answer framework. So this is a concept I made myself, but you get the idea that it's much more difficult, like there are much more answer options. So the scope of possible answer options is much larger when you have an open answer format than when it's multiple choice. And we think that would be the, the first and easiest step to go to a more difficult and also more uh, natural, similar to the actual programming world uh, type of assessment. Yeah. Uh, so then finally, thanks for listening. The talk, take home messages, hopefully that we've had, we have validated a significant amount of items that hopefully people can use for pre and post testing. Uh, and you can contact me for anything basically uh, via sallyhopewoman at gmail.com. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the inter interesting presentation. Any questions? Well, I do have one, and this is pretty much similar to the question I've asked at the keynote. So, I mean, you've been showing all these concepts, all these computing related or programming related concepts. Uh, can we assume that these computing related concepts have their equivalent in cognition? Like, is there a one to one correspondence or? Do they cloud? I, mean, I understand that if at MAT and if at unmet were different in difficulty, but is it a difficulty question or are we talking about different kind of concepts? I think, well, I think because they're so different in difficulty, we can sort of start to assume that they're different in concept, but it's often <clears throat> tied in with the, the same measurement. So if we talk about conditions, both an item where the condition is met and where it's not met are classed as the same thing, but maybe they shouldn't. The same goes for if you have like an if else statement, it might be easier to execute just the if branch than the else branch because they've done the if statements before, but they, they're not familiar with the else branches, if that makes sense. So yeah, maybe it is different, but I don't think we can tell that from this uh, data collection basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I see the point, and it's really the question of, of so, I mean, it's, it's always a question of computational thinking, whether we are looking at it from the computer side or from the individual side. And yes, I mean, obviously, the aim here is to, to get to the point when kids or adults, when individuals understand the concept, because they have to in order to be able to use it. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I completely understand your point. Thank you. Eva has some uh, question. Thank you for your talk, Sally. And we will definitely keep in mind that there's possibilities for collaborations also via Felina. Um, I also want to ask questions about the difficulty level graph you showed. So you basically show like some concepts seems to be harder than others. And are you really sure it's about the concepts or is it also about the type of items? So I can imagine that some types, some I, uh, concept types of concepts need to be measured with a more complicated item because the con So is there, are there any confounds that some potential confounds that some concepts seem more difficult, but it's just because of the way the items were formulated? Well, so the hope is because we try to keep the formats entirely the same so you would have like a little graph uh, like the the grass square and the syntax is fairly similar <clears throat> that those kind of constraints should be eliminated as much as possible but the one thing we did include is the fact that uh, the number of arrows or instructions you have to process so if you have to process an if else statement that counts as more instructions to process than if it's just two arrows for you to process and that's included in the model but still um, yeah, so that, that is a significant predictor, but together with the actual content of the item. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 